Welcome to the Smokies and Wine podcast with JB and Jamie with the best guests, wine and chat. You know it makes sense. Sponsored by Clack and View Wealth Management, working with you today to plan for your tomorrow. Welcome to the Smokies and Wine podcast. Today we are drinking a Cabernet Sauvignon from Matthew Fritz, courtesy of our friends at Wine and Something. Uh, check them out and don't forget to use your Smokies 10 code to get 10% discount. And delighted to say that we are with world-renowned jockey William Buick. How are you, William? I'm very well, thank you. Nice to join the join the show. Got to start off with the, what's happened today. Congratulations, couple of winners up at Haydock, was it? Yeah, thank you. No, it was uh, it was a good day. It was two rides, two winners, so that was 100% strike rate. Uh, six hours in the car round trip, so it's nice when it works out. How, how come only two rides? Is that just the what happened? Or well, well yeah, it, like we, the horses, they get declared for each and every race 48 hours before the race um and then obviously um your agent like my agent he would have a plan so to be honest with you today today earlier on in the week and the last week i thought i'd have for example five or six rides but those horses that i was that, that, that i was supposed to ride they just didn't run for could be any any number of reasons maybe they weren't 100 percent right or the trainers didn't think they had a had a good chance in the race so but look Two rides, two wins. I'll take that. Yeah, the first the first horse you rode today. What was this? What's it called? The first one because it's really good. That horse, Mandub. Is it Man Man Mandub? Man I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you remember because I already forgot. <laughs> no, I've read about Man Boobs. It's not too bad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, he did. He did well. He's uh, he's two from two, so um, young horse still. Yeah, is he, is he one to watch? Is he? I would say he is. Yeah. I would say he is one to watch. Uh, keep on your side. I mean, I wasn't the strongest race today, but he's the horse is two from two, so you can't fault him. There's a, there's a tip for our listeners. Mm-hmm. Get on, man. That's dude. it. Yeah, yeah. See, keep see, on your just side. on on horses. I, I'm guessing, and I don't know. I, I, I'll come clean. I don't know a huge amount about horse racing, but when when it comes to the, the horses, does the the jockey pick the horse? The horse pick the jockey? Does it have to be a relationship? Or are you just told? You're racing this today. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, it's a very good question. So basically, you know, you've got your jockeys, trainers, and then you've got the owner of the horse as well. And each stable would have usually a stable jockey. And behind the stable jockey, there might be like a second jockey or a third jockey, you know. So obviously, um, that would then, that trainer would use his stable jockey. And each jockey has an agent. And then it's the agent's job to ring up for the rides that are available. Um, so, like, obviously, I'm a um, stable jockey to Godolphin in Newmarket. So I ride first choice rider for, for, for them, which is a, which is obviously a, a great position to be in for me uh, with so many nice horses and so many horses. Um, but then when, when I'm not required to uh, ride for them in a race, my agent would basically have free reign to try and get on the best horse in the oh, race. Okay. Oh, from other stables? Yeah, yeah, for, for, from, from other stables. And look, okay. you have no real right to ride a horse. It's, it, you know, the trainer has to want to put you on the horse. And ultimately, I guess the owner of the horse has a big say as well. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of factors involved. Um, and it's quite, it can sometimes get a little bit political. Uh, you know, some people don't like using other people and, and stuff like that. You know, as you can imagine in sport, it's always plenty of uh, stuff going on behind the scenes. But, um uh, basically, outside of Godolphin, for me, for my sake, you know, I ride for pretty much anybody. So your agent just gets on the phone if you want to race that day or two days later, and he just well, I, I was on the ground and yeah, yeah. My my agent works seven days a week, and I was on the phone to him. I would, I, I would, unless he wants to know something from me in the mornings. I would, we, we would have a like a regroup after every race meeting on a on an evening on the way home. So no different to any other day. I phoned him up on the way home tonight and I think it was quarter to five. I was on the M6 and he had been, he was still in the office and he'd been working since quarter past five this morning. Um, Getting you right. So you get, he's got, he's got a, he's got about five, four, five, four or five jockeys, me included. And obviously with Royal Ascot coming up next week, he's ultra busy, you know, trying 
to get on those good horses in those good races. And, and it's all about trying to kind of see things happen before they happen, if you know what I mean, um, predict where horses are going to run uh, and then do the horse to do the form of the horses. So if you have a choice, you pick the right horse. Um, so there's a hell of a lot of work goes in it that goes into it. Do you get final say? So if he says you're on this, you could say no. Yes. Yeah, I, I can. Uh, but experience tells me that's never a good idea to go against him. <laughs> you know, he's, he has his eye on the ball 24 seven. Right. Um, so you and, trust him? Uh, he, I trust him and, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he, he is very good at his job. I'm going to guess that you're very sought after, um, particularly j- just now uh, with, with where you are in the, the, the racing world. But let's just go back a step to sort of where it all began. Um, obviously, your father was a huge uh, racing jockey over over in Norway. What was he an eight time cha- eight times Norwegian champion? Was it eight times? Yeah, yeah. But how did you get into it? Was it on the back of him or? Yeah, basically. I, I mean, you know, um, obviously, dad. It was that's all we knew growing up. He was he was riding. He went off to the races. Um, then he trained in Germany, and uh, then eventually we came back to Norway. And he trained and rode a little bit as well. And obviously, mum was uh, riding as well. She had ride as an amateur jockey, and she was a you know she she is a very she she still actually she she still rides, uh, not in races, but she does ride and exercise. And um, you know we were just a very sort of horsey family for like very um, racing orientated family. So it was a very um, natural way for, for me and, and my brothers to go. And obviously I was lucky enough to, to get some, to get a pony. And that's where it started. You know, me and my brothers went to riding school and in Norway where we grew up. And I, I remember, you know, it was, it was in the winter, in Norway in the winter, you can imagine how cold it is. <laughs> I mean, Scotland gets pretty cold, but Norway gets really yeah, cold. And it was another level. It, in inside this riding school, it, I mean, it was like minus fifteen, minus twenty, and mum and dad were watching us ride, and we fell off, and we were all over the place. You know, it was, it was, uh, it was, but it was good fun, and you know, we, we learned the right way. Then eventually, I, I got a pony, did a bit of show jumping, pony racing, or whatever, and you know, I was just, I, I was, I was bitten by the bug, um, and obviously in Norway, it's a, it's a relatively small sort of industry and then I started coming to coming over to England and um, I started I joined Andrew Boldings first on school holidays and I loved it I, I absolutely loved it I, I lived in a hostel there and I was with the lads and obviously I was, I was young and I was I was very wet behind the ears I was very green you know I didn't coming from Norway I didn't understand the British humour or anything and obviously <laughs> my language wasn't, wasn't great either so I had a it was a it was a learning curve, a steep learning curve, but it was good fun. Obviously, then when I eventually left school in Norway, I, I went straight there. Started off with that uh, that summer. Uh, I can't remember what year it was. It must have been I must have been seventeen, I think I was. So what's that now? Thirty? Well, it's a while ago. Five ish thereabouts. Something like that, yeah. And uh, never looked back since. Hard work, proper old school uh, apprenticeship. Um, you know done all the jobs uh, that apprentices do all the all the in the afternoons when when all the older lads would be having a kip or down the pub or something they'd be picking stones off the gallops and doing all, all, all the all the all the apprentice jobs um, but look it stood me in good stead and then when eventually I started race riding I, I got I got some great opportunities there um, you know I, Andrew Andrew Balding had uh, had a lot of faith in me and obviously having my dad uh, on the on the touchlines as well was, was massive for me because, you know, one thing with dad is he, he says it how it is, um, whether you're his son or, or not, it doesn't matter. He's non-biased. So, you know, there was a couple of times where I was slacking, not paying attention and, you know, he let me know. And it was, and it was good. It was in, in, invaluable advice for, for, for someone coming into the game at, at my age. Because your, your dad's our growth, isn't he? Yep. Yeah, because we well we've got our both fathers as well, and yeah, we, yeah. Know, we know exactly what you <laughs> yeah, mean. Yeah, yeah, like. yeah. <laughs> they say it like yeah. it is. They don't mince their words. And and when you say slacking, is that just not concentrating enough, or or in what no, way? I, I, I had my first ride. No, sorry, 
I think it was my eighth ride. And I remember any time I could get asleep, I would sleep because I was so tired. Early mornings, yeah, you know, afternoon stables, every it was just so I, any moment I could have a kip, I, I would have a sleep anyway. So I was at Salisbury, and I'd already had a few rides and hadn't had a winner yet. And there was one of the rides I think I had at Nottingham, and I didn't particularly cover myself in glory, uh, but I was young, and it was it's part of the learning learning curve. But anyway, I was um, th- this day I, I wasn't riding, so I'd done my morning stables, um, you know, rode rode about four or five horses, and then um, I was at Salisbury riding the next day. But there was Salisbury, the race meeting was on, it was like two day meetings, but it was on this day as well. So my dad calls me on my mobile and he says, uh, are you watching Salisbury? And he could hear, I was in the hostel, he could hear. I, he woke me up, I was asleep, obviously having my afternoon nap before evening stables. <laughs> he, he, he sort of couldn't, you know, he let, you know, I was riding at Salisbury the next day. How could I not watch Salisbury before I'm riding there, you know, see what's happening, watch the track. So I, <laughs> Quickly put some clothes and I ran downstairs to the TV room in the hostel and <laughs> and made sure I watched it. Um, and look, looking back, you know, it's uh, it's great to have someone that that does that to you because uh, you know, as a young lad, you need to be steered in the right direction. Yeah, with his experience, he'll know the dodges, won't he? Well, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's the thing. The, the pitfalls that there are, of course, many of them, and you know, I certainly learned from some of my mistakes, but. Um, yeah, no, you know, he was, uh, you know, still is, still is a, still is a very um, important, but he's always a very important person to me. But in in my career, you know, he's still very, very helpful and comes with good advice. Um, and so does my mum. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a well trodden path that he knows very well. And it must have worked because you were you were an apprentice jockey two years in a row. Was it back then when you were just sort of starting out? Yeah, Leicester I, Award. I, I was. I was uh, one year. I was champion apprentice. I missed just missed out on the first year, but I rolled out my 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 allowance, my, my claim, pretty quick. And I was very small. I, I was quite late maturing, so I was, I was small and a little bit on the weak side. And I think I rolled out my claim in about eighteen months. And my dad sent me to America two winters on the on the bounce, so I didn't sort of waste my my riding allowance, the weight allowance that apprentices get get given. So I didn't waste it riding winners on your weather where it was relatively bad racing, you know, um, not very important and, and you would you weren't really going to get noticed. So I could save my 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 riding allowance for the bigger handicaps like Royal Ascot, um the the bigger races where that weight allowance might might count. Um so he sent me to America for for those two winters, which again was was a great experience, and then after eighteen months, I lost my weight allowance, and it can be very tough for apprentices to lose a weight allowance because, you know, apprentices ultimately they they get a weight allowance. You start with seven pounds, then you ride twenty twenty or twenty five winners. I think it's twenty. Then it goes down to five pounds, and then you ride fifty winners, and then it goes down to three pounds, and then you ride ninety five winners. And you, you you lose it, so you have nothing. So then you're, so I was here. I was, you know, lost my claim, and I was on a level playing field with Frankie Littori, yeah. you know, uh, and, and only having had eighteen months experience. So you know, you're a tough sell to trainers. You did the ninety five winners though, yeah, to get to I, that zero. I had a ninety five winners, yeah, but it it happened in, in a very short space of time, so. You know, experience-wise, I was still a bit behind, but I was very lucky that Andrew Andrew Gold in my trainer stuck stuck by me, and obviously, you know, my dad did his job behind the behind the scenes as well, and and I managed to get through it. And um, you know, Andrew basically made me a stable jockey pretty soon after. You now you mentioned America there. What what actually is the difference between racing in America and the rest of the world? You know, I mean, the American jockeys don't seem to travel. Is there too much no. money money there, and vice versa? <laughs> yeah, I mean, is that harder yeah, over it, there? Is it easier? Is it? Well, it's know. good. It's 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 a very good observation. Um, I mean, the American jockey. So it's all about the different circuits, different tracks. So they would have what they would call meets. You know, so like you, 
if you're based in California, you're based in California, you ride Santa Anita and a handful of other tracks. If you're on the East Coast, um, it was called Belmont Aqueduct in the summertime, Saratoga in the summertime as well. And then in the wintertime, you go down to, to Florida, to Gulfstream Park in Tampa. And you might nip into New Orleans for a race or two there. But they, they're they based um, in one place for a lot longer. While in this country, like one day I was, where was I Monday? See, I forget. Lingfield Monday, Salisbury yesterday, Haydock today, Newbury tomorrow, Sandown Friday, Leicester Saturday and Doncaster Sunday. <laughs> you know, when we see the American jockeys and they ask us, you know, what 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 meeting what what meeting you at, at the moment? What what meeting you at, at the moment? You're like, well, I'm in the UK. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there, there's there is no meet. You're all over the place. And obviously, the American jockeys they have a good um, a good system in in that sense. But obviously, obviously, America is a hell of a lot bigger than than the UK is. And like you touched on as well, their their prize money is phenomenal. On average, it probably is one of the highest in the world. I'd say, you know, you look at some of the the American jockeys' earnings, you know, it's phenomenal, phenomenal, really. Well, I noticed um, the total earnings, and I think some of them must be retired because they had like 35,000 races, but they've earned half a yeah. billion dollars. Yeah, I mean, Mental. I, I think a good friend of mine, Johnny Velasquez, who, who, who dad knows well as well, you know, I work for his train, I, I rode work for his trainer in America, and I actually rode some work with him and rode some races with Johnny. Uh, he's coming over next week for Alaska as well. He, he's a great guy. Great jockey, absolutely, you know, one of the very best in the world. And he he's he's got that sort of, you know, his his purse is 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 somewhere near that, you know, his lifetime earnings. And you know, it's it, it's 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 phenomenal really how um how much money it is. But I suppose the business model is very good over there. It's 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 you know like anything, once you once you hit big time in America, then there's no stopping you. Would you would you move there, or is that no? I, no, no, no. It's too late. Um, I thought about it. Me and my dad, we thought about it long and hard. And I actually got a. When I was very, I was obviously over there, spent the winter over there. I actually got a, a kind of a bit of a, a pretty formal offer to stay. And we did we did think long and hard about it because I, again I was very light and I was very small and I sort of my build suited uh, American racing. And you know, I took I took to it. I enjoyed it, and but I sort of thought, well, I, I I'll come back to UK first, see how we get on, then we can make a decision. And then when I came back, things went from from strength to strength, and and you know, I got better. The results got better, and then and then here we go. I mean, I, I mean, I'm in a great position now, and no regrets. You mentioned uh, that you were the right build there, just. Just in terms of build, I'm not sure how how tall you are, but how tall are you, and what's the ideal height weight for a for a for a jockey? Because your diet must be so yeah. strict. There doesn't seem to be an off season as such. No, no. Uh, I'm about I'm a what well, am I five foot six, something like that. Five foot seven. Is that about right? One sixty eight centimeters. They're not sure. One hundred and sixty eight <laughs> centimeters. I am. That's oh, it's metric. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> we'll work yeah. it out later. <laughs> but uh, you, you you would say I, I, I am genetically fortunate because I, you know I am a good size, a good build. I, I manage to I manage my weight well. I manage to sort of do gym work, have a good diet without having to you know spend time in saunas or hot baths or stuff yeah. like that. So yes, I do have to watch it, and the odd day I might have to have a a sweat in the bath, but I have to might have to take, have to take a pound or two off. But essentially, I'm, I'm I am quite fortunate, and that is a big advantage because you know you, you see some of the lads what they have to go through to to just keep their weight at what they are, and you know most of them are probably two stone on the weight. You know, yeah, really, you're doing a job that is that is as hard as 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 this. It's uh, it's tough, and mentally, and physically, it's very hard. Yeah, it must think, be one of the most dangerous sports in the world. Well, it's, I think it's the only sport in the world where we're followed around by an ambulance. Yeah, so <laughs> it's crazy, right? That's true. Absolutely. Now, I, I don't know how, how fast you're going at the start. Obviously, 
now that you know the championship race and horses are going around sort of 35, 40 miles an hour? Is that there or thereabouts? Yeah, there or thereabouts. I mean, that would probably be a sprint race. So look, they vary. Obviously, distances where vary, you know. But um, I mean, they they sort of the fa- the very fast horses they they can reach you know those sort of speeds, you know. How I'm imagining, not that I would ever be doing it, but imagine myself, I would be scared out of my mind on a horse at, at that sort of speed. What, what are you thinking when you're other than just hold just, on? Just hold on. <laughs> well, that's what we look for. We look for the fast horses. That's what we try to get on. <laughs> that's, that's what the, there's, there's that's no the fear at all there, William. Not that's, even at the start. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Get on the fastest one. Get get from A to B the fastest. On, on that subject, if, if you jump on a horse, do you say to yourself like a new horse? You go, shit, this horse is fast. This is good. Do you know straight yeah, you, away? You, you, yeah. Well, look, you you are obviously in the race after the race, you you know straight away. But you can you can when when you're experienced and you've ridden so many horses, so many races across the globe. You can sort of, you can, once you get on a horse, you can get a pretty good gauge of what you're dealing with, you know. You, you, sometimes you can get like the in-between ones, which are hard to gauge, but you, you can, if they're really bad, you, you know about it. And if they're really fast, you know about it. Do you sit in a race and just know with the engine underneath you, you know that when you're coming up near the end of the race, you're just going to wipe everybody out sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? You know yeah. you've got yeah. it in the bag. Yeah, well... If you wipe them out, then you might the stewards might have a word with you. So you need to have a you need to be a little bit careful about that. But um, no, you, it's a little bit like uh, I want to compare. I suppose it's a little bit like driving a car. You know, when you, when when you're sitting in a fast car, you know if you put the foot to the floor, you know you're gonna take off before you do it. Riding a fast horse is similar. You know, you you could hold on to it, not going very fast, in behind other horses in the race. You know, you pull up, get a bit of room, and you just know your horse is going to find three gears immediately, instantly, and it's going to be race over. And that is, that feeling is like a drug. I mean, it's, um, that's what we all look for. Jockeys, trainers, horsemen, you know, everyone. That horse that can do that, you know, sort of go as quick as other horses go when they're flat out and then go quicker go quicker again. It's a, it's a phenomenal feeling. In that, in that situation, like when you know you've got it, you've got a bit of room and you're off, do you shout abuse at their joggies? Do you say bye guys or anything like that? Is there uh, any bad that going on? No, I wouldn't, there's no abuse, but I, I've, I've, um, there was once, there was actually last year and uh, I, I, there was two horses from my stable and it was only a maiden race. So they were, these horses were inexperienced. Um, it was at Newmarket. And I was obviously on the one that was perceived to be the best one. So my horse was favourite and the other horse from the same stable, which I could have rode, but didn't because I thought the other one was better, um, was obviously ridden by another jockey. And anyway, so two furlongs from home and I'm, I'm in front and, uh, you know, I'm working away on my horse, asking for more, asking for more, asking for more, and I'm not getting it. So I'm flat out here. So I'm thinking, well, something is going to come and pick me up here because I'm just not going quick enough. You know, yeah. this is not I'm too far from home and we're empty. We're completely empty. And uh, this other horse from the same stable comes past me and a jockey said to me, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Willie, this is a, this is a group horse. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I could, I could sort of remember that. And I heard it clearly and it was just a, and he was right. The horse, the horse is a group horse. It was a, it was just a funny, a funny story. You just have to shrug and go. Well, that's it. I can't. I can't fight back. No, 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 no. That, that was a. That was a proper. A proper. Uh, you know, you you class told and uh, my horse. He were definitely simply not good enough that day. Is there is there tactics in racing? Do you go in with a set plan, saying I'm going to go behind this one to start with, or is it just on the hoof? So yeah, to speak? it's it's it's, it's on the hoof. It, See what I did there. Yeah, See what yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a. Uh, it's it's a very, very, very tactical sport. I mean, most of the time, the margins between win and, winning and losing are very small. And stuff that goes on early on in the race or middle part of the race can have a massive um, impact on what happens on the finish line. So tactics are, are, are a massive part of the game. You know, you look at a race, you think, well, 
the first thing you look at is where you're drawn, you know, what, what, where, where you're drawn, where you're going to, what stall you're going to start the race from, you know, has the horse raced over the distance before, has the horse raced on the ground before, you know, what, you know, find out as much, find out as much as you can about your horse and then find out as much as you can about the opposition. Look, look where the pace of the race is going to be, who's going to make the early running. Is the pace going to be very fast? Then maybe sit back a little bit and pick him up late. If it's going to be very slow, then you need to maybe be a little, a little bit closer to the pace. So yeah, it's it, it is very tactical, and certainly the best riders across the world they are all great tacticians. You know whether they ride in England, Ireland, France, America, Hong Kong, Australia, Japan. You you to be a great jockey, you have to be a great tactician. And in the lanes, do you get is is it potluck which lane you get put in? Or is it yeah. Not- yeah, so that's a basically, yeah, that's basically random. Right. Um, so you can't control that. So, you know, you can sometimes get a, a great draw and you think, well, okay, great. Make the most of it. Make it work for you. Don't lose that advantage. Make it work Make it work for you. Get a good position or do what you have to do. And if you get a bad draw, well, make the most of it again. You know, kind of try and work around it. You know, try and find a, try and find an edge. So, okay. so there's no favourites like in swimming. You know, you don't get the middle lanes or anything like that. It's a flat draw. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, it, it's you end up anywhere. Lock. Yeah, he's pot lock. Yeah, you have no control, no control of that. What's your favourite lane then? Well, you you want to any any track. You you really want to be inside. But look, it depends what horse you're riding, what track you're at, how the track's playing out. There might be a little bit of a bias on the track. You might have to be certain part of the track on the day. You know, you never know. So. I haven't got a favorite draw because, you know, you can make an outside draw work, you can make an inside draw work, you can make a middle draw work. It 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 depends what horse you're riding, what race you are in, and what track you're at as well. On on about tracks, and you mentioned Hong Kong earlier. I'm, I just used to yep. live. I'm just back from living over abroad there. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of Happy Valley? I know you shot tins like the main one, mm. but have you done Happy yeah. Valley? Yeah, a couple of a few times. Um, I love Hong Kong. I've I've, I've had a few years now I've had offers to go spend a bit of time over there um like a winter stint and I, I I've been I've been very tempted to to do that and I think you know it's something that I would like to do before I before I finish up riding you know there'd be there'll be plenty of time for that so um but it's it's a great place racing over there is fantastic you know it's obviously a a, a huge um you know pool of betting it's uh you know the the money they have um, on 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 betting at each meeting in Hong Kong is is crazy. The sums are unbelievable, That's and nice. obviously that reflects in the prize money and and you know it, it's just a, it's just a very well ran. The Hong Kong Jockey Club is is a very well ran um, jockey club, and it's 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 fascinating. Happy Valley, obviously in the middle of the city, it's it's a saucepan. It's it's tight. It's exciting. And, you know, Happy Valley, you could be on the best horse. If you're drawn outside, you haven't got an advantage, for example. So you need to be Happy Valley, being as tight a track as it is. You know, you it's key to have an inside draw. And then when you get that inside draw, you need to make it work. How, how come they always manage to get eight horses in Hong Kong at the line at the same time? Because they're all <laughs> handicaps. They're all handicaps, you it's see. It's crazy, man. Everything's yeah. finished. But they're all... See, the, so Happy Valley especially, they're all handicaps, mostly. So... You know, obviously the handicapper's job is to level each horse, each, each horse out. So, you know, if I was running against Usain Bolt, he would have to carry 100 kilos and probably more to level us out, you know. The, the handicapping system there must be amazing because it always, so le- it always levels out. That's what, it's all, about. That's what yeah. it's all about. If you make it, a, the whole idea is to make it a level playing field. And talking about tight margins, I mean, the margins in Hong Kong, they're there. They're so so tight, and the jockeys over there, they probably do more more work on tactics than most places in the world because it's it's so important because of the small margins. Such a physically demanding sport. You must come off after every race absolutely shattered. Are you not? Or no, no, you're not. <laughs> well, because we do it every day, you see, and obviously we get ourselves up to a. So I spend all winter when I'm in Dubai, 
you know, primarily we only really race once a week, sometimes twice a week. So I have a lot more time to to go into the gym and mm-hmm. do the recovery and everything else. So I, I do a lot of work in the, in the gym in the winter and get myself up to a level where I can get home here and and I still I still I have a gym at home and I still I'm still there most days, but. I don't have to do as much and all I have to do is just maintain my fitness and it will carry me, carry me through the season. So, um, I mean, you can have, you can have 20 rides a day and you, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be necessarily tired. The, the tiring part of the job is the traveling, Yeah, you know, the, the driving hours on end and, and, uh, you drive yourself, William, surely you must have somebody doing that. I, yeah. I, I have a full-time driver. Yeah. I was waiting to say, cause we've that would spent, be too much. Spent, I think so, so far this year we've spent, he, he looked at the, the, the computer on the car. There's 214 hours together so far this year in the car. Yeah. What's his chat like? <laughs> he's quite funny. He's all right, actually. Yeah, he's a Scouser, <laughs> so we're all right. Go on a bit. Well, Scousers, on about accents. Yeah. You don't. You don't have any Scottish accent at all. Your dad. No, being... well, I've never lived. I suppose I never I lived in Scotland. So, I know, but um, your dad. What's your dad's accent like? Does it rub off a wee bit, or is he no, lost I mean, his he's, accent he, as well? He's, I think he's lost it as well. Yeah. But we 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 chat in Norwegian quite a bit, so um, yeah, I suppose he hasn't lived there for a while either. So um, you've got no problem understanding us, though. I'll have to I'll have to come over for for a couple of weeks holiday, and I'm sure I'll pick it up. Have you been to Scotland at all? Yeah, yeah, I went to Musselburgh once. All oh, right, so you've not been to Arbroath? No, I have when I was very young. When I was oh, very right. young, yeah, a long time ago now. It's a long time ago. To be honest with you, whether I should remember or not, I'm not quite sure, but I don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, no but that's that's something that yeah we, we as a family we, we're going to head up hopefully we can we, we were actually wanting to do it you know pro- probably some some stage last year but obviously with everything going on we couldn't do it so yeah. you know hopefully sometime this year we'll, we'll be able to come up well you can bring up the Melbourne Cup or something when you win that yeah that'll do yeah I top, top man yeah that'll do yeah. <laughs> <laughs> speaking about victories you, you've obviously you put you, the last I looked at, you'd had somewhere between 1,300, 1,400 winners. Okay, yeah. Is there is there one in particular victory that means means the most to you? And and also, what would be the, the big one for you that you maybe haven't won that you would still like to win? Yeah, obviously, you know, the derby obviously stands out as, as, as the one. Obviously, it was last Saturday. I finished third this year and I won it in 2018. So, ah, look, that's... You know, in our book, in my book, it's the greatest race of them all. Uh, it's the ultimate horse race and it's our most important race for sure. So that's my greatest one, I would say, if you single one out. But there's more than one I want to win. You know, I, I want to win so many more races. Yeah. There's, there's, there's the Arc de Triumph in Paris. There's always the Melbourne Cup, Japan Cup. And then, look, I want to win the Derby again. I want to win. I want to, you know, this. it's... it's um. You know, there's there's uh, there's many races I want to win. The Kentucky Derby would love to, yeah, but I think it's going to be very tough. Does <laughs> uh, Good, Godolphin put horses in that? Yeah, well, obviously Godolphin have a they have a um, like an, a bit of an American out, outfit as well, so they have horses in America that are based in America. And actually, they had this year's favorite for the Kentucky Derby. He finished fourth. He won Essential Quality. His name is he actually he won the Belmont Stakes in Belmont Park last Saturday. Very good horse, trained by trainer called, um, oh, is it Chad Brown? Oh, yeah, Chad Brown. Yeah, you're right. Is it him? <laughs> I don't know. I just said that. Is it him? <laughs> <laughs> See, when, you're saying he, when you're saying someone like he came fourth in the Kentucky Derby, do you watch a race like that and think you could have done better? If I was on that horse, I would have sorted that well, out. That particular horse, he was actually a little bit unlucky. He got, he got, he got slammed out of the gates, out of the stalls. Um, and then he, he was he, he was in an unfavorable position, so there wasn't anything the jockey could do. It was um, the jockey did well under circumstances. It was just luck just wasn't on his side. But whether he would have won or not is a different matter altogether. When you say slam, do you, someone bashed barged into him. Yeah, either he, he side, so he was in the middle, and boom, just got slammed. Yeah, but look, it, it, these things can happen. You know, they're animals, and sometimes they jump either side. So. Especially coming out the stalls, you're all rammed in together, aren't you? So yeah, and you know in America as well on the dirt on, on the on the dirt race on the sand surface, the dirt the dirt in America dirt racing, you know it's all about speed and position. So if you, if you lose a length at the start, 
you'll have five five lengths to make up in the race. Um, we were chatting about a horse because we're not horsey guys, but we were chatting about a horse. Not? No, we're not at all, as oh, you can right. tell. I thought you were. <laughs> There's one horse we were chatting about, Frankel. Oh, yeah. Because you would have seen that Frankel, wouldn't you? Yeah, I, I rode against, I, I raced against him, I think, every single start, apart from two. There was two races he had as a two-year-old where I, where I didn't race against him. So if he's 14, you did 12, yeah? Yeah. And was he that good, yeah? Uh, unbelievable. Um, he was, um, and I rode some very good horses against him. I, I rode, I rode Dream Ahead against him, who was uh, a, a, a champion sort of sprinter, seven furlong horse as a three-year-old. He was a group one winner as a two-year-old as well. I rode Nathaniel against him, who was a group one winner as a three-year-old and a four-year-old. I rode some great horses against him, and he just—he was just a, a different, different league, different. He, he breathed, breathed, breathed different air. Could he make an average jockey? Like could he win regardless who was on him, basically. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it, that look. He was just. Uh, he, I mean, you—you you would have never seen. I have never ever seen or witnessed uh, whether there has been a horse of his ability. I, I couldn't tell, but it's certainly from. My experience in horse racing, I have never seen uh, anything like it, and I, I would I would go as far as saying I, I don't think we ever will, really, because he was he was unbeatable. You know, where can you ever say he's unbeatable? He had everything thrown at him. You know, he had good horses, he had tactics against him. Sometimes he had other horse had stable mates against him. You know, uh, he went on firm ground, soft ground, different distances, different tracks. He was good at two, three, and four. Just a just a through and through champion. So you you were just in the park in the middle of the race, knowing that this horse is next to you and is just going to go off. Yeah, well, he was never he really. He, he wouldn't be. He wouldn't be next to you for very long. Yeah, yeah, but you know, you know, <laughs> he would just he would just be high and by and off he'd go. Or, or or if 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 he was in front of you and you followed him, you know, next thing he's he's gone. So it was it was no look. It was he was a, an amazing horse. He's an amazing stallion now, producing some great horses. He obviously produced a derby winner in Adia, yeah. who Charlie Appleby trains for Godolphin. And, um, you know, he's just, uh, his legacy is, gonna, is going to continue, Frankel. And, yeah, you know, I, I think the only thing we can do is count ourselves lucky to be having ridden against him, I suppose. And us to witness it, yeah. yeah. Well, on about horses, because you're in the know, you're in the industry, what the hell happened to Shergar? I don't know. You, you're, you're... <laughs> Surely you must know. Nobody knows what happened. No, no. No, never, I don't know. You never hear anything when you're out and about with all these trainers and everything? <laughs> How many years ago is it? Oh, Christ, that's 40 years ago, is it? Maybe. <laughs> no, is no, it? Word, no word on the street? <laughs> I haven't heard anything recently, no, to be honest with you. It's like Elvis, someone saw him working in a chip shop. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Franco was Shergar in disguise. <laughs> Uh, See, with, with, with a horse, obviously, Frankel, just from what you've said, in a class of its own, but there's so many good horses out there and the, the speeds that you're racing at, there's an inevitably going to be injuries when people fall off. You, you've been no stranger to it yourself. You you were knocked unconscious coming off the horse, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, look, it, it's it's unfortunate, of course. Um, it's something that you just want to get on with and, you know, you, you just get on with it and then, Touch wood, everything else that you know, you don't have too many too many of them. Is it is it something you worry about in later life with things like CTE or anything like that with the chronic brain traumas and stuff? No, don't don't, don't even think about it. No, you're thinking about it now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't think about it. Look, you just get on with it, get on with the job, and and you don't think about it. You know, there, there is of course risk assessment going on. You know, you you try and you try and um, reduce the risks and stuff like that. You know, but. Essentially, you just do your job, and and listen, I'm I'm doing what I love. So, um, um, you know, I I count myself as lucky, earning a living by doing something that I've been wanting to do all my life, and I love it. And the Tory's like fifty odd. Do you see yourself going that long? He's yeah, Frank. He's he's fifty. I mean, you know, Frank is a good example um, to young jockeys because he he's got a good diet. He's fit. He never really misses a day in the gym, um, and Obviously, he's genetically gifted. He's 
he's certainly the most gifted jockey I've ever seen. Naturally gifted rider, um, amazingly natural, and obviously that carries him through. So, uh, you know, on top of that, he's, he's he's got a good racing brain and everything else. So he, he's just a great jockey. And but look, he, he's looked after himself well. Um, obviously, he's been relatively lucky with injuries. Um, but yeah, if you you know you, you don't want to get too far ahead of yourself in this game, but um, you know everything got yeah, everything's going well. You 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 look after try and look after yourself, look after your body, look after your mind. And as long as you have influx of of nice horses and nice races, and and you get the opportunities, that's important. That's important as well. You know you need to be getting the opportunities in in the good races. Um, you need to still be having a good brand. You need to be able to sell yourself. And you need to be good enough to comp- when you get to that age. You need to be good enough to compete with the younger jockeys. You know, like like uh, some of the older footballers that are great. Obviously, Frankie he wouldn't ride seven days a week because you know he, he's looking after himself, so he saves himself for the big days. You know, like some of the great footballers that that getting older, like Ronaldo. I mean, he's not as fast now as what he was ten years ago, but he has the the brain for it, so he's in the right place in the box at the right time to score the goals. You know, so that never goes away, does it? How close are you and Frankie? You quite tight, or is he, do you see more yeah, of a competitor? Yeah, I moved to Newmarket in 2010, and he took me under his wing, and he just said to me, "Look, if, if there is anything you need, just come, come and give me a shout." And we shared lift race, lift racing a, a lot, and um, he's just a great guy. Look, everybody, you know, many people will, will say that about him, but he's got a good heart, great guy. And and when I was younger, he was always someone I could I could go to and and sort of hear him out about stuff. He's got that little trick, or I don't know if he still does it or not, but he used to you know, jump off the horse. Yeah, he still does that. He's, yeah. he's still young enough to do that. Do, do you have a little trick up your sleeve that you think, I better have a party piece here? My backflip. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't quite got there yet. Now, you've had, you've had, have you not had a few nights out with uh, Frankie? Yeah, yeah. We've had some good nights out. <laughs> All of them good? Some of them, some of them better than others. <laughs> Are we allowed to talk about the one in Dubai, the the uh, the retiro party? That's the first. That's the first time I've ever been asked since. Uh, yeah, that was. Uh, yeah, look, to be honest with you, that was wrong place, wrong time. Young, yeah, you learn from the last. You said earlier, you learn from your mistakes and you move on. Uh, yeah, that hurt that one. I mean, I mean, for anyone listening, unfortunately, it was a a, a broken jaw, an unprovoked attack, just. Did something kick off, or was it someone trying to make a name for themselves, or do you even? Know? I'm sure. I, I'm. I'm pretty sure it did. I was unaware of it. Obviously, right, okay. you know. Um, uh, yeah. Look, I don't remember much from it, to be honest with you. Don't worry. It's happened to both of us and our bros. It doesn't matter. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Can I just talk about again? Bear in mind, I'm a, a horse racing novice in terms of fans, but the actual the technique of riding um, a horse, and you know. Things that, that I've read about that you're particularly good at that I can't say that I 100% understand. So it's maybe just to give people a bit of an understanding of how, how difficult it, it is. But yeah. the, the things that I've read about are you're particularly good at balancing a horse. Yeah, well, obviously when a horse is running fast, you know, not, not every racetrack is like slick, you know, not every racetrack is flat. Very, very, actually in this country, very few are. Um, there's undulations, ridges, um, some camber different ways, round a bend and stuff like that. So it's it's very very important to keep your horse in a good rhythm and to keep the horse balanced. And like Epsom, where the Derby is, especially important around there because that is a very challenging challenging track, and horses can often get unbalanced there. So as a jockey, you need to support them a little bit. But look, uh, yeah, I mean, I just try and get my horse into a nice rhythm. Um, you can find, you know. I think as a jockey, the worst thing you can do is try and make your horse go faster earlier in the race than what he is capable of. You know, the horse will find a rhythm and he'll go that speed and then you can build it up gradually and get the horse balanced, get the horse using his his body correctly. And, uh, but look, it's it's easy said and done, yeah. But um, essentially, it's just keeping the horse balanced, keeping the horse comfortable and at the same time, keeping a good position and uh, having every chance of winning the race. Do, do you feel it in a race if the horse starts to get spooked or anything or starts to lose rhythm? Do you feel that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for example, if a horse races for first time, for the first time, um, like a young two-year-old or something, you know, they it's it's their first 
time at the races. So they can be quite spooky and quite like uh, scary, you know, they don't have a clue what's going on. So then it's the jockey's job to teach them and, and you might have to support them a little bit more than you would a, a, an, old, a, an older horse with more experience. Bit of a horse whisperer, yeah? I wouldn't say that, but I think every jockey, <laughs> you, need, you, need to, you need to be a horseman. You need to be a horseman. To be a good jockey, you need to be a horseman. You need to have horse sense. But I'm no, I'm no horse whisperer. But you need, you need to understand the horse. And and uh, at the end of the day, they generally weigh 500 kilos. So you need to get along with them because there's no point having an argument <laughs> with them. <laughs> what about changing the legs? I re- apparently that's you, you, so you almost rest a leg so that you then go ch- change the leg when you're on that that last sprint for the finish. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, if you're resting on a, on a, for example, a uh, a left-handed track, you know, the horse would use its left lead round the bend. And then in the straight, it would switch on to his, his, his right lead. Uh, that That's very apparent in America. You know, they get, the horses get taught that from a young age. So they, when they come into the final stretch, they switch on to the right lead because that's their sort of their fresh leg. Yeah. So then they kind of, they either can keep going or they sometimes can find another gear. Yeah, that that's, it is quite important, it, you know. If if you have a horse that goes through a race on the same leg the whole time, it's either because they may be hurting on the other leg, they're not quite comfortable putting that one down, or you just haven't got the horse in the in the right rhythm, if you like. Yeah. And and as a jockey, you you sort that out, or does the horse do that naturally? The horses should do it naturally, but you can you you can sort of you can help them do it, but it's it is it, sometimes if if you do try and do it to a horse, so you've got to be a bit careful because sometimes you can cause sort of unnecessary interference, if you like. Yeah. You know, you might have one go doing it. If they don't do it the first time, then leave it. You know, let them get on with it. Yeah, you don't want to piss it off in the home straight, do you? Don't want to piss it off. No, exactly. <laughs> He's gone 40 miles an hour. <laughs> What's this guy trying to do to me? Yeah. yeah. You, you mentioned earlier on, you're in the Godolphin uh, stable. Is that... Do you get signed for a set time period or something like that? Or is it as long as you're still winning or do you sign a contract for a year, two years? How, how does that type of thing yeah, work? Yeah, it's, it's, it's obviously a, it's a contract o- over a period of time. And um, I mean, it's, it's like any, any other job, really. You know, you, you, you sign on, 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 a, on a bit of paper and it's over a period of time. And like any sport, I suppose, it's, uh, it's results that matter. So you need to produce yeah. the goods. You need to produce the results. And that's as simple as that. On about results, it's uh, Ascot next week, yeah? Yeah. Come on then. We need some massive, massive, massive week, five days. It's now this this uh, might the... this might sorry, this might be going out after Ascot. So what you tell us Okay. This, already... is, this is a prediction. So yes. when we uh, listen yeah, to this, yeah. we'll be able to find out if you were right or not, because this is probably uh, yeah. going to go out after Ascot, definitely. So basically yeah. the two of us will bang our house on these horses <laughs> and okay. nobody else will be able to do it. So come on. Better not give him my dress then. Fess up. We got a I mean, I mean, it's the, it's the it's the most important five days consecutive. It's the biggest meeting in 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 in, in the world. Yeah. Obviously, the Derby is a bit most important race, but it's the biggest meeting. It's amazing atmosphere. It's great. Obviously, we've got crowds back this year, which is all important. I'm not sure how many are allowed in each day, but at least we got something. I mean, last year it was, you know, those big races really suffered because of it. You know, yeah. obviously, it was the same all over the world, but. We're delighted to have crowds back. Uh, it's important, especially Royal Ascot, you know. And look, I've got some nice chances. On the first day, I think, yeah. <laughs> Do you already know who you're riding then next week? No, no. I, I know roughly what I'm riding on the Tuesday, the first day. Um, and look, the first day looks pretty tough. The tough races. Um, if I were to pick one horse uh, as a chance... I would pick a horse called Highland Avenue in the St. James's Palace Stakes. Highland, um, well, that's nice, Scottish. Exactly. Um, he's he, he's he's gonna he's the ground's gonna be fast, which he likes. It's gonna be a good race. It's gonna be a very tough race, and he does need to improve. But I do think he has the required improvement in him. And are you, are you on that one? I'm on him. Yeah. I wouldn't be giving you one that I'm not on. Oh, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Christ, yeah. favoritism. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right, number two. That's your first favorite. Number two. That's that's the only one. I, that's the only. That's the Tuesday. That's that. And then I, I have. Um, I'm. Just, I, I mean, it's a little bit early yet, so I'm not quite sure how the week's going to build up. We have a nice two-year-old that might be running later in the week. 
name, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then... Oh, we're not getting the name. Yeah, let me just have a look. I got, I got a list here. Let me have a look at the list. I should have you, all this in my head, you see. Are you not writing man boobs, no? Man, no, a horse called Manabu might be running, though. Similar name. He might be running the Queen's Mars. He'll have a chance. Ooh. Manabu. Manabu, yeah. Queen's Vars. He'll have a chance. And then we've got uh, the Gold Cup is obviously one of the the sort of the, the, the benchmark bases of the week where I'll be riding Spanish Mission. Um, he's taken on Stradivarius, who's hot favourite. But I think Spanish Mission, if he does, if he stays the trip, he's got a chance. And if the, uh, and if the jockey does a decent job, yeah? If the jockey doesn't mess it up, yeah, as always, obviously, it's only all down to the jockey. <laughs> Apart from when it wins. <laughs> and then, uh, and then we've got new signs in the Chesham on the Friday. Um, new signs. Uh, he's a two. He's a two-year-old. So he, he's. Um, Was that new signs or new science? Did you say new, new new science science? science. As in, so um, yeah, it's still early days. So that's sort of a bit of a rough outlook, to be honest with you. Well. That's four. I'll do that. I'll do a nice wee accumulator on that. We'll tweet them out after the event. Obviously. We'll wait. We'll give you anything away. Don't I'm worry. Not driving the odds up and the odds closer on this. No. Just when you mentioned crowds there, William, does it make a difference to you? Are you aware of the crowds when you're hurtling along at, at 40 mile an hour on a, a, a half a ton beast? Well, at the end of the day, we're there to do a job. So crowds or no crowds, it helps to keep, when it's no crowds, it helps to keep the horses a little bit calmer. Because there's no razzmatazz, or there's yeah. no like atmosphere. So horses, obviously the animal, you know, it's it's a calm uh, setting for them. So it, which in turn then makes our job easier. But then when you win, you haven't got the, you know, you're coming into nothing. When you win as a close, it's you know, quiet, you know, and there's nothing going on. So um, look, it, it is a crowd sport. We need crowds. It's like football. Uh, it's like any other sport. We need crowds. We need the fans. So we are much happier when there is crowds, um, for sure. It's it's it doesn't feel like you know last last year. Yes, it was Royal Ascot. They did fantastically well to organise it how they did, and all the races were there, and all, all the good horses turned up. But it didn't feel like the normal Royal Ascot, you know. Yes. So I'm looking forward to that this year. It's going to be great. Weather looks like it, the forecast looks like, like it's going to be good. There's going to be crowds back. So the racing is fantastic. So hopefully I can nick a couple of winners. Yeah, yeah. and when you win, you're not going to do a backflip to no fans, are you? Well, you're not going to do that. I, you know, I've practised it all my life up, up until now. So let's hope it works out. <laughs> you got, you got to get a cheer. <laughs> See, just b- b- before we, we, we let you go, um, you know, the, the more sinister side of any sport is always you know, they, they would call it peds in most sport, but drugs. But I, I guess it's not that so much the jockey, but, you know, horses sometimes can be, you know, that there's rumours anyway that they're drugged either in a good way or a bad way. When you're in a race, is that something you can pick up on that this one's been given something that's holding it back or not Not on your own horse, on a, on a yeah. different horse? Yeah, um, no, I, no. I, I mean, I, I've never witnessed it or been sort of involved or near any of that. Never really seen it firsthand. Certainly never rode a horse who I've of thought course. has been has been on anything performance enhancing. And I mean, obviously you get isolated cases that get, you know, a big spread in the media and the press. And rightly so. It's cheating, isn't it? At the end of, of the course. day. Of course, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But they get caught. So it is a very clean sport. You know, the horses are completely drug-free. It's zero tolerance. So same with the jockeys. But of course, when, when you do get a case, like there was one in America recently, um, it's first page news, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but that's one out of how many, you know? Yeah. I think when um, the rewards are so high, it's inevitable someone's going to try something, no matter what the sport well, is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's short lived, though, isn't it? Because you get caught and then you lose Absolutely. all the. It's a, bit like, it's a bit like Lance Armstrong, isn't it? You know, it becomes pointless. Was, was there, um, a t- there was a trainer at Godolphin, wasn't it, a handful of years ago? Was he no, not yeah, that was, before, that was before my time. Yeah. Um, obviously, I read all about it. But um, yeah, look, like I said, like I said earlier, 
you know, the, the systems in place for the testing and everything like that. So it's zero tolerance. And if you, you know, if you do it, you're going to get caught. Simple as that. Yeah. You're not going to get away for, with it for long, are you? No. And look, it's, it's a very, um, it's a very competitive sport and it's all about, it's, it's all about producing the best horse and then the best horse goes to start and then produces good horses. So in that sense, it has to be clean. It is clean. It's uh, yeah, it's just the way it is. It's, it's zero tolerance. Final question from me then. You speak four different languages. Who told you that? You just yeah. heard on the on the grapevine. Yeah, da. <laughs> <laughs> don't ask me. Don't ask me about the other two languages, then, please. I'm, I'm not even going to ask you to do anything in those languages. But the Euros yeah. are starting on Friday. Yeah, yeah. Who, are you who are you supporting? That's true. Oh, I'm, I oh know, by the I way, know sorry, sorry to jump in. I seen you doing keepy ups on YouTube in an England top. What yeah. the hell was going on there? Well, I live. I live here. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, that's not good enough. You're not connected. Scottish dad. Is um, your, your mum Danish? My mum's Danish. I've got a Danish passport, Danish citizen, and uh, there's live in nothing. England. There's nothing English going on there. So that question that JB's just asked you, there's no yeah. way you can say you're supporting England. No, well, no, I support Norway. Then it's safer, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you can support anyone you want. Um, Thanks. More importantly than that, we wish you all the best for Ascot. We'll obviously be watching. Uh, yeah. we'll find out. We, we will keep those tips, but we won't release anything till after it. Um, just in case anyone does cry foul play and we've been getting tips from the pros. Um, <laughs> uh, so thank you very, very much for coming on uh, and talking to us. You've been far too kind with your, uh, with your time. Just as a point of note, just for anyone listening, we, we managed to squeeze this in tonight just because something else happened. William was good enough to agree to come on next week, which at the point, that when you were saying that, I didn't even realise that was going to be Ascot week. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't realise either. So I'm glad we got it. Yeah. William, thank you so much. All the best for Thanks, next. Thanks, lads. Week. Cheers. You've been listening to the Smokies and Wine podcast, sponsored by Clack and View Wealth Management, working with you today to plan for your tomorrow.